Hi there, my name is Max Kerminski. I'm a computational media PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. In this talk, I'm going to open with a brief introduction to story sifting, what it is, why it matters, all that stuff. Um, then I'm going to talk about example-driven synthesis of story sifting patterns and sort of the technical approach that we're developing in this paper. Then I'm going to talk about Synthesifter, which is a sifting pattern authoring tool that makes use of this technical approach. And then finally, um, talk about some broader implications in future work that I'm interested in. For context, I'm going to start out with a quick example of what I love about emergent narrative games. I'm currently following Blaseball, which is a sort of surrealist multiplayer baseball roguelike idol game. And a few weeks ago in Blaseball, something really weird happened. There's this player Workman Gloom who's a batter for the Canada Moist Talkers, and he was incinerated by a rogue umpire. That's not the weird part. The weird part is that somehow, eight minutes later, as his last act in the game, he managed to hit a solo home run that brought his team into the lead. Presumably he then immediately collapsed into a pile of ash or something. But it's this kind of unscripted narrative wildness that to me makes emergent narrative so exciting. No one intended for this to happen, not the developers, not the players, not anyone, but it did happen all the same. And now it's this sort of fantastical story that players can tell and retell consistently going forward. The problem with this approach to storytelling is that, in general, you tend to accumulate a ton of detritus in these games that makes it hard sometimes to see what the actual interesting storyful stuff actually is, right? So like there's so much going on in these worlds, so many details, that they just sort of like flood you with information and there's there's no way to tell what the, the interesting stuff actually that's happening is. But what if we could do something about this overwhelm, right? For instance, what if we could develop a system that's capable of automatically identifying the most narratively compelling stuff that's going on in these simulated story worlds so that we can then surface the key stories for the player to see? And when you do something like this, you could then have the system look at a, a wild sequence of events like this one and go, Oh wait, what? What just happened? That's really interesting. Let's highlight and accentuate that in the same way that the player community for Blaseball tends to do. And we call these kinds of systems that can automatically identify the interesting narrative stuff in a simulated story world, story sifters. Uh, this is a term introduced by James Ryan, a recent graduate of my lab. And basically what we do in this approach, this sort of curationist emergent narrative approach, is allow the simulation to produce an overwhelming amount of content, which it's often very good at doing and then start to filter this content down into a chronicle of game events, which we can then sort of search within for narratively compelling sequences of events and pull these out to automatically surface them to the player as micro stories, like this one. And this might be sort of familiar to people who have been following our lab's recent work on story sifting. What we've got here is a micro story where a character starts a project, decides it's not any good, gives up on it, a second character comes along and talks to them about this project several times, and then finally the first character decides to resume work on this project because of the other character's interest. So. The thing that you have to do to make these systems work is to provide them with sifting patterns. And a sifting pattern is a specification of a group of interrelated events that make for good or compelling narrative building blocks in some way. And ideally, because the number of sifting patterns you have correlates with the diversity of um, emergent situations you're able to recognize automatically, you really want there to be a lot of these sifting patterns. And as a result of this, you really want these to be as easy to author as possible. Because in this curationist narrative context, what you're really looking for in, in sifting pattern authoring is the same things you're looking for in content authoring. You want the, the people who are doing the content authoring to be authoring sifting patterns that are capable of recognizing a wide range of emergent narrative situations. And that's led to the development of systems like Felt. Felt being a, a sort of domain-specific story sifting language um, that we have developed in our lab to, to make this sort of content authoring for curationist emergent narrative easier. And you can see here that this is sort of a logic programming language. It's divided up into clauses. The first clause here is saying that we're looking for a sequence of two events, event A and event B. Um, we're looking for event A having event type of betray, so events can have attributes on them, for instance. Uh, event B is also a betray event. Event A has this actor character who is bound to the logic variable care. Event B is bound to the same variable for actor, and so they have the same sort of actor who perpetrated both of these events, basically. This character has to have the trait impulsive. And then we're also looking to exclude situations where there's another event between these two events, event A and event B, that was perpetrated by the same character and was something else. So basically, altogether, we're looking for a sequence of two betrayals perpetrated by the same impulsive character who has not done anything else in between. And this is kind of a typical, moderately complicated example of a felt sifting pattern. The problem with this is that it's still hard to write these sifting patterns, right? You still need to learn the syntax, which can be tough if you're a writer, for instance, who's not used to programming at all. Um, even if you're used to programming, you have to learn different semantics than what you might be used to, because this is not sort of a procedural programming language like Python or JavaScript or whatever. It's a logic programming language which has its own sort of weird semantics associated with it. 
In addition, you need to learn the relevant simulation concepts to whatever specific simulation domain you're currently working with. So you need to know, for instance, that your events have attributes like event type or tag or actor, and that these things are bound to entities like characters, for instance, and that might vary from simulation to simulation. And in addition to that, it's also easy when you're writing these sifting patterns to forget important constraints. Things that make the sifting pattern make sense to you as a human and that are very obvious to you as a human. Things like, I need these two characters to always be family members or to be sort of rivals, and otherwise the sifting pattern doesn't make sense. But the computer doesn't know that. And so if you're writing these patterns, it can be easy to accidentally leave stuff like that out and then write sort of an overgenerous sifting pattern that matches too many sequences of events, like more than you intended. So what if we could just like point at some examples of the micro stories we want to match and let the computer do the work of writing the code for us, right? If the computer can generate the sifting pattern, then we don't need to worry about all these problems of writing it by hand. And that's when we get into the territory of program synthesis, which is basically anytime you're having the computer write the code for you. This both sounds scary and is kind of scary because the search space of all possible programs in any non-trivial language felt included is really, really big. Now, luckily for us, we're actually specifically in a narrower territory of inductive logic programming, which sounds scarier, but is actually less scary, because in inductive logic programming, it's sort of this very well-studied and, and sort of there's a long tradition of working in this space of basically synthesizing logic programs that discriminate between positive and negative examples, the, the examples of things you do want to match and the examples of things you don't want to match. So what we're trying to do here basically is to get the computer to write for us a felt sifting pattern, and felt is a logic language, right? So it's in this space, um, that distinguish between positive examples of event sequences that are interesting to us and event sequences that are not interesting to us or negative examples. So let's look at sort of what this might look like in the context of Blazeball, for instance. Let's say we want to write a sifting pattern that, that deals with a situation in which a weak hitter is performing unusually well, then fumbles at a pivotal moment in a way that maybe prevents their team from winning. To do this, you first need to define these concepts of a weak hitter and a pivotal moment in some way that the computer knows how to understand. And the way that we actually do this is by um, defining a whole bunch of inference rules, which are basically equivalent to data log inference rules or prolog inference rules, or um, in your favorite logic programming language, maybe ASP, it's, it's sort of the same concept. You define rules that say things like a player is a weak hitter if they're both a member of a team's lineup or all the batters they've got on rotation and their batting stat is two stars or less. Similarly, a game event might be defined as pivotal if it's an attempted hit and there's a runner on third base, which means that a score is likely to happen if this, if this run goes through, and so on and so forth. And you as the simulation definer basically provide the computer up front with a bunch of rules that sort of tell it, here are the interesting concepts in this story world. Here are the things that you might want to write sifting patterns about. Then what you do is provide the user with an interface for selecting positive and negative examples. Basically, you can sort of provide them a list of all the events that have happened in the story world, maybe filtered or like sort of searched through somehow, and let them pick, okay, this sequence of three uh, events is one of the instances of the pattern that I'm trying to define. This is another instance of that, and so on and so forth. And to start out with, mostly you're probably providing positive examples because of the things you are looking for. And then negative examples come in later as a way to sort of further refine the sifting pattern that the system initially generates for you. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But once you've got these positive examples picked out, you can do property generation. And properties are basically simple yes, no questions that the system knows how to ask about any given sequence of events. So in this case, they can be things like, does the first event in the sequence have the tag swing and hit? Does the second event have the tag score single? Are the batters for event one and event two in the sequence the same? Um, is the batter for event three weak per those inference rules we defined earlier? And so on and so forth. We've actually got a whole host of property generation strategies or sort of like high level approaches to generating properties for event sequences. So there's four main ones. Number one is that for event n in the sequence, does it have a certain attribute? So does the second event in the sequence have the tag swing and hit for instance? Then do events n and m have the same value for a certain attribute? For instance, if they have the same actor or the same batter. Number three is, does event n match one of the inference rules we defined earlier? So is the third event in this sequence an instance of a pivotal event in the game per those inference rules? Or is this a situation where there's a weak batter at bat? And then finally, are events n and m related to one another in some way per those same inference rules we defined? So if we've defined a rule for characters are rivals if this, this, and this, then we can ask, okay, are the characters perpetrating events one and three in the sequence rivals to one another? And that's another one of those sort of concepts that might be interesting for whatever reason. 
Once you've got a lot of properties generated for each of your positive examples, you can then sort of start checking them against one another to make sure that properties hold for all of the positive examples and filter out the ones that don't. So in this particular um, sort of scenario, we've got a property where, oh, the first event in the sequence looks like it's always swing and hit. And we've tried that on all of the examples that have been provided and it's always true. So we're gonna keep that one. However, if we look at the second event in the sequence, well, that was a score single event um, in the first and the third examples, but in the second example, it was not. So we're gonna exclude that property from consideration because it's not always true of all the positive examples. Similarly, um, is, event three's, uh, is event three an event that happened in the last inning of the game? Well, that's true for the first example, but not for the other two. So we're going to exclude that property from consideration. And then once you get the set of consistently true properties, you can start translating it into a sifting pattern. So we can take each, each property here, translate it pretty directly into exactly one clause in the felt domain-specific sifting language, and then add some set of clauses at the start, which do things like introduce new logic variables that are sort of used for convenience later on. So for instance, we bind the batter of the first uh, event to E1 batter, the logic variable, and we bind the pitcher of the first event to E1 pitcher, and so on and so forth. Then finally, we exclude um, set of clauses whose logic variables were not actually used later on in the sort of real, like sort of central clauses of the sifting pattern. And what you're left with is a complete felt sifting pattern that defines the rule, match things that look like these positive examples, basically. And in order to make this more approachable to users beyond just this textual language, we provided this authoring tool for sifting patterns that helps them do some of this work. So on the left-hand side of Synthesifter, we've got this sort of searchable scrolling log of all the events that have happened in the simulation. And you can see that we've got sort of three events marked right now. Those are the yellow highlighted ones. Events 13, 14, and 23 are sort of the example we're currently looking at. We've got the sort of text box at the top for, for searching for events that might be sort of have a certain tag or that might be sort of perpetrated by a certain character or whatever. Um, on the right-hand side, we've got the positive examples that have already been selected. This is looking at some sort of romance scenarios. Um, and you can see that we've got two examples already selected, two sequences that are basically the things that we're looking for. Then up top, based on that, we've got a sifting pattern, which is the sifting pattern the system is currently synthesized based on those positive examples. Now this is an editable text box, which means that you as the user can come in and add additional clauses yourself. You can prune away clauses that are sort of too specific, you think, or you can modify these clauses to sort of change how they're, how they're looking for what they're matching. In addition, you've got the set of pos possible matches down below, which are additional matches that the user has not specified as either positive or negative, but that are matched by the current sifting pattern. And so what you can do is basically interactively refine the sifting pattern by looking at these possible matches and going, yes, I think that's true, or yes, I think that's false, um, to try and sort of give the system a more nuanced understanding of what it is you're looking for. And between that and modifying the sifting pattern directly, you eventually produce a sifting pattern that is something like what you're looking for. And then you sort of do that all from the beginning again to define other sifting patterns. And the thing that I find really exciting about this as an interaction approach is that it gets to this idea of human-centric program synthesis, which is what Will Crichton calls the applications of program synthesis that open up when a user has the programming skills to express specifications of their intended behavior at a level beyond just providing positive and negative examples. Um, in, in other words, basically using, in the context of Synthesifter, program synthesis as a teaching tool that helps build up users' understanding of the felt domain-specific program synthesis, or felt domain-specific uh, sifting language, right? Like, as you go through this process of authoring with Synthesifter, you learn more and more of the syntactic constructs, the semantic constructs, and the simulation domain constructs that enable you to sort of frame sifting patterns for yourself in your mind. And eventually you might get to a stage where you're sort of independently of the tool, able to write sifting patterns on your own, whereas you weren't before. This approach also has a couple other advantages. You can kind of see it as a machine learning-ish approach that is less data hungry than a lot of the traditional sort of machine learning based proc gen approaches. Because in this case, what you're doing is having the user provide only a few sort of very carefully chosen positive or negative examples that then enable the system to do much more sort of generalization because it can sort of count on the user to have picked examples well for it. Additionally, you also have this sort of property of inherent interpretability that's often missing, I think, from a lot of proc gen ML systems where because you're generating a readable um, program in a human readable programming language, the human can then go in and sort of look at the individual clauses of it, decide whether those clauses make sense, remove ones they don't like, modify ones they want to tweak, and add new ones. And altogether, this produces this nice sort of 
effect of being able to control it much more effectively than you can often do with these these um, opaque neural network based um, approaches where you end up with the rule that you're looking to, to express being encoded as a bunch of weights in a neural network. In the future, we're interested in using these tools to write an artificial baseball commentator. So sort of a system that follows along with a baseball match and in real time adds sort of color commentary to it and sort of draws out narrative arcs based on what's going on in the game. You can sort of follow along with that at the repository link I provided. We've done some work on that already. We hope to publish about it in the future. Um, we're also interested in extending Synthesifter to provide more support for sifting pattern authoring beyond just this program synthesis stuff and really extending it into like a general purpose um, authoring tool for story sifting patterns. And finally, I'm also excited about this idea of incorporating program synthesis into more PCG pipelines as sort of an additional tool in the PCG practitioner's toolbox. I think it's a really exciting possible solution to this controllability problem in particular, right? Because of the inherent interpretability, because of the fact that you can use it with few examples. And I'm just really excited about like what this implies for both PCG in general and then also narrative PCG in particular. So yeah, I think that's all I've got for now. Happy to take any questions. That's my website. Thank you.